while you do that, I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm, I'm Gemma. Um, I'm uh, Scottish, as you can tell, but I'm based in, down in London, so it's really nice to be home for a change, um, talking to my people. Um, yeah, as, uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm co-founder of an organisation called Science Disrupt. Um, we're a media organisation, we run a weekly podcast, uh, we do monthly events down in London. If, any, if anyone wants to run anything up in Scotland, please let me know, because I would love to have a Scottish branch of Science Disrupt. Um, and we do a bit of online editorial, and we also run um, a Slack group, which is basically for any, uh, does anyone use Slack here? Oh, great, okay, awesome. Um, so it's basically a cross between kind of WhatsApp, Facebook group, and email, and it's a way of taking lots of people together to collaborate on lots of different projects. We have 550 scientists, startups, um, VCs, government, NHS staff, all on there working on various different problems. It's free to join for anyone. If you check out our website, you can get involved. Um, so the sort of stuff that we kind of talk about a lot, we have five focus areas. Um, we do health, space, energy, advanced computing, and research. And um, I guess the research element of that is, um, I guess, the most interesting one for this audience today. Um, so a lot of people we interview in our podcast, we're talking about how to disrupt peer review, how to change the way we publish, um, how to rethink the way we do metrics. Digital science is one of our biggest backers, and um, so that's kind of the stuff we talk about. Um, so today I wanted to talk about this idea of redesigning science for the internet age. Now, my day job outside of um, Science Disrupt is I'm a journalist. Um, I have a background, I studied maths, but I didn't, I, I didn't go and do a PhD, I'm not a researcher. Um, but I think a lot about startups, um, about the sort of system that Stuart's maybe not quite as, as uh, happy about as I am. Um, but I want to kind of, from that perspective, try and think about how can we influence or think about different ways of doing academia, thinking about how that success has manifested itself in the sort of tech industry, and that's what Science Disrupt is all about. Um, so, let me give you a little bit of context as to what I'm talking about. This is a company um, based in London. I don't know if anyone's heard of PaveGen. Um, they basically are a, a, an energy startup. Um, they create these tiles. Um, you put them all on the ground and you stand on them and it, it generates energy for every step. And, um, and, and, and in London, they're, they're really, uh, pe people love them. They get written about in all the press. Um, they are the science startup in London. They get crap loads of funding. Um, but it doesn't work. It, the physics doesn't work, okay? You cannot generate that much energy from steps. And any kind of person who works or has done GCSE or standard grade physics should know this. Um, and it kind of makes me think about another startup that I don't know if anyone heard about the Theranos debacle that happened. Um, this was a, a startup, a Silicon Valley startup, that were all about disrupting the way we do um, blood lab testing. And they said you could do it with a drop of blood and you could do it in a tiny amount of time. And they have this certified laboratory and they got millions and millions of dollars of funding. VCs were like, oh my God, they're going to change healthcare. And this, this woman, Elizabeth Holmes, was like the, the next gen scientist. And there's all these pictures of her looking like Steve Jobs. And it, it was, and then last year it realized that it just didn't work. And she ended up getting to core and it was awful. And everyone started going, oh my God, biotech startups, let's not invest in health at all. None of it works. Um, but you know, the same thing happened. She got lots of coverage, front page of Fortune, all this sort of thing. So from my perspective, as I like science startups and I think that there is a big revolution happening in the world of commercializing science out of labs and getting people talking about biotech and space applications and God knows what else in a totally different way. How can I, as someone who, to an extent, understands what's going on in the research world, try and convince these guys what's good and what's not good, what sort of things you should read and understand and, and, and get to know versus the stuff that's just hype and that it's not real science, it's not real stuff. And that's kind of some of the place I'm coming from. So one of the big problems with the people who are, tend to be writing, or fund, writing about or funding this sort of thing is they just can't access and they can't read science. It's the standard problem. You can't get behind a paywall if you're not with an institution. And even if you did, it's too complicated to read. So um, you know, I, I think everyone in the room kind of gets that. Um, if you want to know more about my thoughts on that, um, I'm going to mention my TED talk. I talk all about this problem. Um, but it, it's true. When it comes to thinking about who are writing the headlines and who are trying to push forward funding, we think about corporates, we think about uh, you going beyond the general public. This problem is really big, but it's massively, massively influencing where money is going and, and, and what sort of stuff gets done. Um, and that's an issue. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how it is that we can try, and at least from my perspective, thinking about how we can change that. And you know, we've already spoke a lot about some of the really amazing tools that are at the fingertips of scientists to try and do things a bit differently, try and get research out in a different kind of way, 
try and get people understanding what's going on. And if there's any of these you haven't heard of, I would urge you to go and have a look. Everything from uh, Authoria Overleaf doing your collaborative uh, notebooks, the protocols for managing and sharing your protocols, data sharing, Publons for tracking all your peer review. And Labworm are awesome. It's an Israeli a startup that uh, basically tracks all scientific uh, digital tools. And you get a newsletter every week. It tells you five new tools that you can try out as a scientist. Uh, it's awesome. So there's lots of stuff happening here and it's great and I, I feel brilliant about it, but I feel it's very short term. I feel like a lot of this stuff is kind of trying to change something that inherently doesn't work anyway. Um, it's great to have doing collaborative lab notes a bit better or publishing a bit faster or sharing protocols a bit easier. But actually, in my mind, is doing any of these things actually good in terms of sharing science? When you get back to the reason as to why we publish in the first place, it's about sharing the science that we're doing. And in my world, in terms of thinking about journalists and corporates, they don't read papers and they're not going to. No matter how many graphs and fancy pictures you put in them, how open you make it, it's just not their world. Um, it's just not where we go for information. So I want to talk a little bit about this idea of how, how do we totally rethink how we share science? Forgetting about what we have right now, how do we totally rethink that? And how do you actually go about answering this kind of question in a way that's not just idealistic and kind of like, wouldn't it be cool if we didn't publish in Elsevier? Let's, how do you think about that a bit deeper? So I actually had Lyft logo up here, but after Stuart's talk, I decided to delete it because he said it was a big red flag and I didn't want you guys getting a red flag at me at the start of my presentation. But the reason I've put these, these companies up here on the, um, on the slide is I want to make the point around incremental change versus real change. Um, so Airbnb, as I'm sure all of you have heard of or used or whatever, I love it. Um, they are all about changing the hotel industry, right? So they didn't go in and go, okay, what is rubbish about hotels? They're kind of expensive. Sometimes you get really crap service. Um, it doesn't really feel real when you're in a country that's then you're in a hotel and it just feels the same everywhere you go. So they didn't go, okay, how could we build a tool to sell to a hotel to like, I don't know, maybe we could make the insides of the hotel look like the outside of the country or something. Wow, wouldn't that be really disruptive? Instead, they went, no, no, no. Let's think about why is it that humans travel? Why is it that people are interested in going to different countries? What is it that people want when they go from A to B? And they built a tool based on that. Instead of going, look at this existing industry that we have, let's make it better. It's the same with Amazon. They didn't go, let's look at supermarkets and what is it we really hate about going shopping? They didn't go, let's make, I don't know, shopping centers have better payment systems or something. They went, actually, wouldn't it be better if we just had everything here and everyone could look at it on one system? based on, again, a human insight. And the point is, is that what they did is they went right to the bottom of why something exists and then built something instead of looking at what was already there. And that's kind of what, how I would love to think about how it is that we change science. So imagine science was invented today. And let's, let's get away from the fact that we know the internet can't exist without science and you know, <laughs> lots of things that we do can't exist without science. Let's forget about that for a second. 2017, all the tools that we have, we have Facebook, we have Snapchat, we have the internet, we have telephones, we have emails, we have all these things. Imagine you know, you decided, I'm going to invent this thing, I'm going to call it science, and we're going to start investigating the world around us, and we're going to share that information with everyone else, and we're going to build a better world, right? Imagine you just came up with that idea. Well done, that's awesome. Really excited about science. How would you design how to do that? How would you start by going, OK, I'm going to start investigating things. Oh, why is, this, why is this light different than that light? And then how am I going to try and find other people who also are asking these questions, how to share that knowledge, right? So I thought we'd do a kind of little, I guess, a thought experiment as to how at least I would approach that. And maybe you guys will have totally different ideas. But just to kind of elaborate the point of we're not thinking deep enough about how we change science. Um, OK, so maybe I, would, maybe I would post my question on Reddit. Maybe I'd create a subreddit and go, Hey guys, I really want to look into, I don't know, uh, why light is a different colour depending on where it's coming from or something. And I would like, you know, r slash light question or something like that. And I'd be asking questions and I'd, if anyone joined, I would get them saying, why are you interested in this? I would start talking about stuff, asking questions, posting articles, trying to find that information. And I'd create a big thread on Reddit, right? And then once I found some interesting people from all around the world, maybe they're in the same city, maybe they're not, I would go, come join this Slack group that I've created that's called Light Question. And um, I'm going to have a channel on here that's defining the question. And then I'm going to have a channel that says, um, you know, where physically are we going to do this? And then maybe I'd have one on 
you know, interesting articles, all these different sort of subheadings that go into asking this question. And I'd invite all the people who are interested and say, come join my team. Let's, let's ask about this idea of light and let's use this group to project manage this question that I have. And then maybe I would go, actually, OK, we've got this team, but maybe there's another team somewhere else in my city that might know something about this. So I would register for an account on Meetup. I don't know if anyone here uses Meetup very often. I use it a lot. Um, but I, I would create a Meetup group called The Light Question. And I'd have people join it. I'd share it as much as I could on Facebook and Twitter and in my Slack group. I'd get everyone in the Slack group to put it, put it back on the Reddit. And I would, I would get people to join. And maybe I'd end up with 200 people, say, who are interested and start posting events maybe every month and get people to come along and then go, hey, do you want to join my Slack group? Do you want to come think about the light question as well? Awesome. Let's work on it together. And by that, you're gathering all these also interested people into one place. And then maybe I go, OK, we've got, we've got a question. Let's start building some kind of framework to analyze some of the ideas we've had. Maybe I do something like GitHub to put my initial question in a little bit of code. We go, hey, does anyone else know how to use Python for analyzing light? Because I'm not really an expert on Python. And I'd find other people on GitHub are brilliant at Python and I invite them to help me with my project. And also, instead of just having them help, I'd go, this code is here for anyone. It's totally open. So maybe it's useful for your project over there who's asking about the color of wood. Maybe you'd like to use it too. And suddenly you've got this sharing of code right at the center. And I'm not even slightly at the point of thinking about writing a notebook or thinking about how am I going to share this eventually because the whole journey of what I'm doing is totally open for everyone. And I'm using the expertise of a much broader network to get to a finalized point as opposed to trying to do everything myself or within my team. Um, and then maybe, for instance, I'd want to build something. Maybe I'd want to build up, I don't know, a microscope of some description. And um, it doesn't already exist in the world. So I would find people who know how to design digital products and invite them to my Autodesk 360 team where you have a, a cloud. Does anyone use Autodesk 360? Um, cool. It's basically a way, it's like, a, it's like Google Sheets um, but for building CAD drawings for uh, you know, engineering products. So it means that I can work on it as well as you could work on it at the exact same time we can see what's happening instead of trying to do version control and God knows what else when you're doing um, engineering drawings. And again, you can use this all over the world. It's brilliant. Um, and then once I've got to inclusion, maybe we'd worked out why light is a different color at some point. We'd used our microscope and we'd asked questions and we'd done all these amazing things. Maybe I'd just write a blog post and go, this is what's happened. And then maybe I'd just tweet it. We've done our light question. Anyone want to have a check it out? Here's our blog. And I know I'm being totally idealistic, and I know that this is not the way we can suddenly just immediately do science. But I think the point I'm trying to make is all of these tools already exist in the world. They're not made for researchers specifically. They're not trying to change the research process. They're tools that are about collaborative work or about talking to people, about sharing. But my question is, why aren't more researchers just using these tools that are already there instead of trying to invent new tools to try and make little bits of the process better? And that's not hating on digital science. I do think you guys are awesome. But the point I'm making is there's lots of stuff out right there. And to kind of answer the gentleman at the back's question, he was saying about what are these tangible things that we can do? Well, we can do loads of tangible things right now. And I know you guys are busy, and I know that it's really hard doing a PhD or doing research, and it takes up loads of time. But you know, write your research paper for a couple of hours and publish, but then maybe post something on Reddit about it, or you know, kind of try and engage people in a different kind of way and think more broadly about how you can share what you're doing as opposed to just trying to get that article in that journal. Um, so that, that's kind of where my mind is at. Maybe publishing isn't the way to all. And I think, I feel like a lot of people will probably do are underlying thinking that, but know it's the game you kind of have to play in order to do what it is you have to do. I get that you have to do peer-to-peer -peer communication. I get that that's how science works. But I get, I get frustrated at the fact that it stops there. It stops after the paper. We aren't going out and going, how can we properly engage not just the public. It's not just about getting some school kids understanding something that you're doing. It's not just about trying to get a, you know, I fucking love science article on what you're doing. It's not just about that. It's about getting industry to understand what's going on. It's about getting innovators to try and use your research for something different that you would never have imagined. There's lots of people inventing at the moment in so many different ways, and they could totally use stuff that's in papers that's not even getting read, you know? Um, so for me, it's, it's more of a kind of like, yes, publish your paper, absolutely, but let's see what else you can do using everything that the internet affords us. Um, so I guess what now? Um, as I kind of mentioned, I totally appreciate that everyone's starved for time and everyone just wants to 
do their job and go home. But I think if you have a little bit more in you and you're thinking what you're doing is just that little bit more important or that little bit more interesting that other people would like it, I'd urge you to try and find ways of getting it out there. I understand there's the whole scooping thing. I don't really understand it from my perspective because I just think you should share everything. But I get that that's the thing within science. But there's always ways around these sorts of things. There's always ways. Um, and if any of these tools that I mentioned or any of the ideas I mentioned that you're thinking, I don't even know what that means, please come and talk to me because I use all these tools all the time and I love using them because they're so good. Um, and that's kind of all I have to say. So please, any questions, tell him I'm wrong, whatever. <laughs> Thing. I've ever been called cool. On time, which is excellent. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for clock watching. So we've actually got a couple of minutes to spare. We have, we have we're in about five minutes for questions. So then it's lunch. It's oh, yay. Cool. Yeah, Thanks very much, Gemma. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on with the vision. Right? Is that we want to move to something where it's a much faster form of communication, where it's much more collaborative. So the reason I think. What's missing from all those tools, as you say, that are not designed for, for researchers and not designed for research and for publishing, if we can use that expression, is that they're ephemera. What do you mean by that? It, there's no persistent identifiers, there's no archives, they're based on URIs that can then disappear. It needs to be built into a system that, that, has, the depend, that has the propensity to archive and safeguard the, the information, because what's, what Publishing does is two things. One, it enables communication, and one, it creates the archive. So that, so my vision of this is a bench-to-web pipeline that allows all of these pieces of information to be tagged up so that everything has a DOI, so that everything is preserved. Right. Why, don't, why don't you just, at the start of the project, when you ask the question, set up a web page and you publish absolutely everything there? Everything goes there. Everything feeds back to there. Yeah, but maybe it's the archive that your university has. Maybe there's a... I don't believe that that's something we can't do. Because URLs are not persistent. Uh, but, but this, for crying out loud, like, this is 2017. Like, for crying out loud, we can do that. And the, 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 the priority should be getting the information out there. I appreciate that there's stuff that we need to make sure it's consistent and make sure it's archived. But there's so much stuff. I mean, what was it? 50% of papers are only ever read by the person who published them and the person who wrote them. That is a waste. There is a waste of information. So even though it's properly archived and it's in the right place, no one's reading it. So in my mind, I'm kind of like, does it matter as much as getting other stuff out? Maybe that's the wrong question to ask. But I kind of, I think these kind of stumbling blocks that come in the way of sharing, I just think is mental. It doesn't happen in other places. It only happens in this place. I appreciate research is different. But we, we do need to find ways of not just stopping at going, URLs are changeable, so therefore we can't share the science, we can't do collaborative work. That, that, in my mind, that doesn't make sense. No, I think you're right that it augments. And that's, you made that point towards the end, that you can augment what you're doing by sharing through the other channels. Sure. I suppose I have, so yeah. you were first. Hi, thank you. That, that's given me a lot of food for thought. And the, um, the point about people never reading what you've written, that, that's very relevant for me as well. Um, I've been told that by people who actually find my work that they've not actually read the full papers yet. Uh, my question, though, is how do we go about influencing sort of the professors, people who have been there, done that, they've been here for years? I mean, sort of as someone who is a PhD student, I've not heard of many of those sort of online things. How do I influence sort of some an esteemed <coughs> professor who works in a traditional way? Totally understand. Um, my co-founder of Science Disrupt is a computational biologist at UCL as a PhD student. Um, so everything that we do kind of comes from the, I'm like, ooh, startups, tech, can we just do this? And he's like, whoa, wait a minute, we can't do that thing. So we do try and have a bit of a um, work in that way. Um, my response to that, it wouldn't be Lawrence's, my response would be um, uh, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Um, and I think there's, a, when it comes to talking about the ideas of moving things forward and you know doing things differently, asking to do it isn't going to work. Let's be honest, it doesn't work. So instead, is there other ways of finding networks, for instance? I mean, for, not to boast about Science Disrupt or whatever, but we have this big Slack group that has people from all over 
well, actually the world, and we have you know different channels and different things. You could go on and start talking to people about your research and trying to get people's ideas. And it's not about trying to steal each other's things. It's just about trying to get other people's inputs and in collaborations and going, oh, well, that company over there is doing something kind of funny. Maybe we should have a meeting. We can sign an NDA if we need to. I think the point is it's, it's about just getting out there, trying to influence the professor. Maybe it's coming with, hey, I've got this opportunity. What do you think? As opposed to going, would it be okay if I go and explore maybe trying to find an opportunity? They're going to go, no, it's a waste of your time. Go find it and then come back and go, look, we have an opportunity to do this or we have an opportunity to talk to these guys. You know, it's not just, I, there's a lot of, I, I know that I've seen there's a lot of focus on like um, public engagement and doing talks and things like that, but really I think a lot of the stuff that happens is around going and talking to people who actually are also doing something similar and just bouncing off one another like you would at a conference. <coughs> Quick comments and then a question. So the quick comment was that code repositories like GitHub actually are persistent, so just to kind of counter the comment at the front, and the journal of open research software is a good place to find the list of the persistent uh, code repositories and to have a DOI assigned to a blog post type meta. Thank you very much, because I did not um, know that. The question was um, about the kind of disruption elements. So you're talking about Sever being in Amazon, and I know that their kind of publicity spin is definitely that they take what, you know, the visitor experiences or to rethink things from the ground up. Um, I think the things about both of those is that actually where they started up, they were sort of doing incremental change and then accidentally stumbled upon something that's really important, which looks a lot like research, actually. It's sort of, you don't know what's going to be important when. So I think part of my question is just, how can you kind of outline that potentially in a really engaging way? Oh, um, how do you outline the potential of trying to do innovation and disruption? I mean, that's like, the golden question you go to any corporate innovation conference and everyone's like how do i convince my boss that they should give me money to do innovation it's like the, the golden question it's hard and um, i think it's about finding case studies it's about finding sort of examples of how other people have done interesting things obviously you're not going to find someone who's done the same thing as you that's kind of the point of innovation but if you can try and find a way of showcasing well they did this these were all the issues that they had they then thought about this and look these were their results Maybe you could let me do this small thing, so little hurdles, try and forget about the bigger picture for a minute, try and just get past these next hurdles and get those approved as such as you go. Um, I, I, you're right about the idea that it wasn't the originally just was like, I'm going to change the world, but I do think there was a different mindset and I do think it was about coming back and going, what is it that we actually want? What is it we're actually trying to do? And I think sometimes that gets lost when we're talking about open access. We forget about the idea of, it's about trying to actually make the world a better place and even if you make articles open, it still doesn't do that. That's kind of the point. Okay. Thank you, a round of applause for everybody in session one.